Welcome to Bullet Point Nursing. My name is Dr. Goldstein, and in this lecture series, we're going to cover essentially everything you need to know for nursing pharmacology. So whether you're here as a nurse, a nurse practitioner student, or a nursing student getting ready for the NCLEX, I hope this series is able to help you. All the notes that we use in this lecture series can be found off of our website. So today we're going to be talking about nephrology, and more specifically, we're going to be talking about diuretic medication. Let's begin with a pathophysiology review. When blood is filtered through the kidneys, it works with a relatively simple process. The blood enters the nephron, and in the nephron, it continues through it until it either gets absorbed back into the body into central circulation, or it continues to the end of the nephron and heads its way to the bladder. As it is going through this process, through the nephron, the body is picking out exactly what it wants to keep and exactly what it wants to get rid of. So what this means is the body may pull some hydrogen back in, it may pull some H2O back in, it may keep some sodium in there, it may keep some potassium in there, and so on and so forth, until it filtered out exactly what it wants to continue on to the bladder to get rid of, and it keeps exactly what it wants to remain in central circulation. When we go through our discussion of dealing with diuretic pharmacology, we're gonna start to learn the different drugs that impact this process. Next, we have aldosterone. Aldosterone is a hormone that increases sodium and water reabsorption back into the body. So let's be really clear, what does this mean? If something increases sodium and, uh, and water absorption back into the body, that means that it's going to hold on to fluid. Instead of getting rid of or peeing out fluid, it's going to hold on to fluid. Next, we have a hormone called ADH or antidiuretic hormone. This hormone is responsible for pulling water directly out of filtrate back into the body. Again, holding on to fluid. Next, I want to just quickly review that when we have a patient that we are giving them a diuretic, we need to generally monitor their kidneys. Again, we're impacting the work of the kidneys for better or for worse. So we need to monitor the patient's kidneys. How do we do that? We do that with BUN, creatinine, glomerular filtration rate. Those are the three primary labs for monitoring how the kidneys are doing. By far the most commonly used one is gonna be a creatinine. Let's talk a little bit before we get into these medications about the patient assessment component, because this is critically important for nursing and nursing exams. Anytime we are giving a patient a diuretic or fluid, on either side of that, whether we're trying to increase their fluid or decrease their fluid, you as an RN, especially for test purposes, you need to understand how to assess a patient's volume status. So it would be fair game, especially on the NCLEX, the next gen uh, testing that's out there now, you want to make sure that you understand how to assess your patient prior to and following administration of a diuretic, and this applies to fluid as well. So how do we check volume status? There's a few different ways. First of all, skin turgor. If a patient is dehydrated, they'll have poor skin turgor, so that's a good um, assessment. And on the flip side of that, in our skin assessment, if the patient has edema, they may have too much fluid. We also want to assess their eyes and nose. If a patient does not have a lot of volume, their output is going to decrease, and we can measure that. On the flip side, if a patient has too much volume, you would expect them to have an increased output. Obviously, all of that can go to heck if a patient's kidneys are not functioning properly. But for test purposes, outside of having a kidney um, pathophysiology, we know that eyes and nose can reflect on a patient's overall volume status. We also have some labs that we can use to monitor for patient's volume status, such as a urine-specific gravity or a serum osmolality. Both of these labs honor a patient's volume status and can tell us whether a patient is dehydrated or not. There are also a lot of other signs we can use for volume overload. We can assess the lungs to make sure they're not backing up fluid into the lungs. We can look at a patient's mucous membranes to make sure they're not really dry, which would be a sign of dehydration, and so on and so forth. I want you to really know all of those things because in test taking, when we're going through diuretics, it is 100% fair game for them to take it to the next level and say, which of the following would be a priority assessment related to the adverse effects of this drug? or which of the following would tell you if a patient needs these drugs, and it could certainly ask you any of those questions relating to volume status um, that we talked about, whether it's lab or actual hands or eyes on the patient assessment. 
So let's talk about the first class of drugs we have, and that is our loop diuretics. The drugs in this class are bumetanide, furosemide, torsemide, and many others. The mechanism of action is that it blocks the body from reabsorbing sodium and chloride back into the body. So what does that mean? If I block the body from reabsorbing sodium and chloride, then I keep the sodium and chloride in the kidney and heading off into the bladder and out of the body. Well, we're talking about diuretic and we're pretty much talking about fluid. So what does sodium and chloride have to do with fluid? Hopefully you already know that answer, but if not, here we go. Sodium and chloride attract water. So if I keep water in the nephron, or if I keep sodium and chloride in the nephron, I'm going to keep water in the nephron and I'm gonna keep it heading out to the bladder versus I, if I allow the body to reabsorb the sodium chloride back into the body, then I would also be allowing the body to reabsorb water back into the body. And this is a diuretic. It's meant to not reabsorb water back into the body, but to keep water going out of the body. What do we use this for? We use it for edema, which is fluid overload, related to many different conditions, heart failure, liver failure, kidney failure, et cetera. We also use this as an alternative option, never first line, for hypertension or high blood pressure. Two major adverse effects of this drug are ototoxicity and hypokalemia. Make sure you're assessing your patient before and after for signs and symptoms of hypokalemia, as well as any issue related to their hearing. Also keep in mind that NCLEX may not ask you specifically to check their lab for hypokalemia. They may want you to know the signs and symptoms of hypokalemia, muscle weakness, dysrhythmias, or hyperkalemia, things like that. So make sure you take it a step further and you understand not only that does this drug cause hypokalemia, but I need to understand what the um, side effects of hypokalemia are and then to know how to assess my patient for those effects. Black box warning for this drug class is that it can cause fluid and electrolyte imbalance. That makes sense. It's a really powerful diuretic, so it can cause fluid and electrolyte imbalances. This is considered the most potent class of diuretics. When you're administering this to your patient, it is critically important to monitor those electrolytes. Obviously, it has a black box warning. However, I would prioritize probably the two most important electrolytes to look out for in your patient would be sodium, because that's the primary one that this acts on, and potassium, because that can cause the most problems in relation to what else this, uh, what other effects this drug has. So sodium and potassium would probably be my two highest priorities um, if you see such a test question. The next drug class we have are the thiazide diuretics. And I did skip one bullet point there. Let's not skip it. The last one, do not increase your sodium intake. What do we mean by that? If the point of this drug is to keep sodium from staying in the body, to keep sodium heading out of the body, if I'm sitting here eating a bunch of sodium, that's pretty counterproductive. So you should educate your patient. Don't alter your sodium intake. So our next drug class are thiazide diuretics. And again, this whole lecture is going to be diuretics. So in thiazide diuretics, the primary ones we have are hydrochlorothiazide and chlorothalidone. We did discuss this in the previous lecture when we talked about drugs for hypertension, but let's go through it again real quick. These two drugs are two of the most common drugs that we use in terms of diuretics. Hydrochlorothiazide actually is the most used diuretic. Chlorothalidone is the most potent thiazide diuretic. It is more potent than hydrochlorothiazide. However, and you wouldn't need to know that at the RN level, but however, note that chlorothalidone, which is considered the most potent thiazide diuretic, is still not as potent as the loop diuretics. What's the mechanism of action? It blocks the reabsorption of sodium and chloride. Hey, wait a second. We just had that as the exact same mechanism of action for the previous class. What's the difference? Here's the difference, the very next few words. And the last one, it said it worked in the loop of Henle. And this next one works in the early distal convoluted tubule. Well, I don't remember a ton from nephrology, but those both are parts of the nephron. So they both do the same thing in the nephron. What's the difference? The big difference is that the loop of Henle is earlier in the process. So by the loop, by acting in the loop of Henle and stopping the body from pulling that sodium and chloride back in, it has a much more profound effect versus the thiazide direct act much later in the process. And by then, there's not as much to work with. So by them saying, no, we don't want to pull that sodium and chloride back into the body, there's not a whole lot left to work with there. So it has less of an effect, which is perfect because we want to have some effect, but not a ton of effect. And that's what this is used for. When we want a much stronger effect, we would use the loop diuretic. But most of the time, the lower effect with the lower side effect is what we want. 
Since you're still here watching this lecture, hopefully enjoying it and learning from it, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button. This channel and our website is 100% free. It's just here as a resource for nursing students, those getting ready for the NCLEX and those going into nurse practitioner school. Please support us. All you have to do is hit that subscribe button and continue enjoying this channel. The next class of drugs we have are potassium sparing diuretics. And depending on what textbook you're using, some books may call it aldosterone antagonists. Either one would be correct. I can't say which one the NCLEX would use. The drug that we're talking about here is really just one, it's sprinolactone. And what does this do? Well, exactly like the drug class sounds, it is an aldosterone antagonist, it blocks aldosterone. What does aldosterone do? Well, aldosterone increases sodium and water reabsorption. We already said that at the top of the lecture. So if aldosterone holds on to fluid, if I block aldosterone, I'm going to get rid of fluid. So this drug, again, helps to get rid of fluid, like everything we'll talk about today, it's a diuretic. What do we use it for? Hypertension, edema, and heart failure. I will tell you, by far, we use this more for heart failure than we do for hypertension or edema, uh, or we use it for hypertension in the presence of heart failure. The big adverse effect here is hyperkalemia. Again, like the other name for this drug class is potassium sparing diuretic. This one holds on. This one does not pee out extra potassium. So this one can actually make your potassium level go up. There are a few other drugs that also make our potassium go up, such as ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So this is something you really wanna check a patient's potassium if they're on an ACE and an R or an ARB, and then they're put also on spironolactone, which is common. They both treat some overlapping pathophysiology, such as heart failure. So you wanna make sure that if the patient's on this drug, we're really monitoring their potassium, make sure they're not also on any other drug that also increases their potassium. If they are, we need to make sure we are implementing follow-up to monitor for that. I am not saying, to just to be clear, that you cannot be on spironolactone with an ACE inhibitor. Yes, those two together are known to cause hyperkalemia, but we do still do that in practice. Next, we have a drug class called osmotic diuretics, and the main drug we're going to talk about here is mannitol. Mannitol works by increasing osmotic diuresis. What does that mean? It interferes with water reabsorption back to the kidney. By increasing the osmotic pressure in the nephron, and forgive me if I'm losing you, but you don't have to know this at a really deep level. So let's just go through the touch the surface. By increasing the osmotic pressure in the nephron, I am keeping fluid in the nephron. If I keep it in the nephron, it doesn't get reabsorbed back into the body. It just continues going out onto the bladder. What do we use this for? We use it for a few things. We use it to reduce intracranial pressure. We use it uh, to reduce intraocular pressure. And we also use it to increase diuresis related to renal failure. Let's take a second and understand how it helps reduce intracranial pressure. Because honestly, that is what this drug is used for much more than anything else. So how does it reduce intracranial pressure? Well, in our head, in our skull, it's a fixed space. We can't just expand. If I get swelling over here, I can just, the skin can allow for that swelling to expand without impinging or crushing anything underneath it. But in the brain, in the skull, we don't have that. If there's gonna be swelling, it's gonna to start to push on whatever else is in the skull since it can't push outward. So if I have intracranial pressure, if I have swelling in the brain, then that swelling is gonna to start to squish the brain. What do I do? Well, if I give mannitol, then I'm increasing the oncotic pressure of the blood system. If I increase the oncotic pressure, when my blood goes through the cerebral arteries, it's gonna pull that swelling because it has oncotic pressure. It's gonna pull that swelling out of the brain into the blood, and then it can continue on out of the skull to the kidneys and the kidneys can pee off that extra swelling. So we do use this to reduce intracranial pressure. How does it work? It pulls, it creates oncotic pressure in our vasculature, which pulls fluid into the vasculature, which in the case of swelling in the brain is gonna pull that swelling into the blood. The blood can continue out of the skull, down to the kidneys, get rid of it to reduce that swelling. Patients that receive mannitol, generally, especially if it's for intracranial pressure, are obviously really critical. We need to very closely monitor their patient, this patient. There's a lot of adverse effects that can develop from using mannitol. And I don't mean this in a bad way. I just mean there's a lot of, since this is such a powerful drug, there's a lot of things we have to look out for. So we have to really monitor their neuro status, their cardiac status, their electrolyte status, and their volume status for any adverse effects of this medication. 
The next drug we have is ADH or antidiuretic hormone. We're going to touch on this just a little bit here, and we're going to touch on it further in our endocrine lecture. ADH is a hormone, and it, in our body, its role is two things. One is to pull fluid out of filtrate, out of the nephron, back into central circulation, also known as holding on to fluid, and it also causes vasoconstriction. Those two um, goals both increase our blood pressure. So again, it holds on to fluid by pulling fluid directly out of the out of the nephron, and it causes vasoconstriction. If someone's in shock or cardiac arrest and their blood pressure is tanking or zero, this really helps. It holds on to fluid, which increases our blood pressure. It vasoconstricts, which increases our blood pressure. So it does have two very powerful effects that are used um, that are useful in a patient that's in shock, and that's pretty much what we use this for. We also use this off-label for diabetes insipidus, and we will talk about it when we get to endocrine. Next drug class we have, or drug we have, is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. I'm sorry, drug class. And the drug here is acetylzolamide. Acetylzolamide is rarely used as a diabetic or uh, as a diuretic. It is used for other things such as glaucoma and AMS, which is acute mountain sickness. How does this drug work? It increases renal excretion of sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, and water. By increasing the excretion of sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, and water, it is getting rid of all these things. That's how it has its diuretic effects. This drug, again, it can be used for edema, not very often, more commonly, and your textbook may even only say that it's used for glaucoma and acute mountain sickness. A few things before we wrap up that relate to all of the different diuretics and drugs related to nephrology. First of all, you have to educate your patient on the side effects of these drugs. Please make sure your patient knows that this is going to make them pee extra so that they're ready for it, especially if they're like a truck driver or traveling. They know to anticipate that. Please make sure you tell your patient to take it in the morning so that they're not peeing all night. Um, and also, finally, if a patient is on a medication related to kidney problems, you must reassess every single drug that they are. This applies more at the nurse practitioner level, but this is something good for nurses to advocate for as well. If someone gets diagnosed with CKD, chronic kidney disease, put on dialysis, anything like that, every medication that they're on has to be reevaluated for dosing because I don't know an exact number, but probably something about 50% of all medications do have to be dose adjusted in the presence of kidney failure. Here are your references for this lecture. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.